Thursday morning here on the Cross Border Injury Podcast. We are back with another great episode of 2022. And uh, I am, uh, I, I told our guest today, I was kind of going to fangirl over him for a few, uh, for the entire interview, probably, because I've been an admirer, her, admirer, admirer of his uh, career in politics and just him as an individual for probably my entire political journalism career, even when I was covering politics in Saskatchewan. And I, I was going to go through the list of portfolios that the guest had, but it would take probably an hour just to read off all of them. So I'll give you some of the highlights. Our guest today is the former MLA for Regina South from, two, uh, from 1995 to 2007. He was the former Minister of Energy and Mines, former Saskatchewan, Minister of Saskatchewan Power Corporation, former Minister of Learning, or as we call it now, Education, former Minister of Finance, and that is Andrew Thompson. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor, and yet again, a pleasure to even be chatting with you today. Yeah, my, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, Andrew, my first question that I always start off with any political guest, whether they be in politics now or past, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Now that's a good, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, there were a couple of things that that came together that I guess drew me into politics. I'd grown up in a politically active household. Uh, my dad had been on town council. My mom had always been active in community politics. Um, I mean, we were just kind of raised to believe that, that there was something important about getting involved. Um, certainly the time when I became more politically aware of myself in Saskatchewan, it was going through a difficult time as it was coming out of the Grant Divine government. It was near bankruptcy. Uh, for young people, as I was coming out of university, there weren't a lot of opportunities. And there was just a real sense of, of despair. Uh, when Romano got elected in 91, I think a lot of us felt that maybe they were turning the corner and it was a chance to, to do something more. And that, that really kind of reinvigorated my interest in politics and allowed me to uh, you know, figure out uh, uh, a path forward. And I tried to do as much research as I can on you, but I, I tried to not do a lot because I want to learn from you. How does a kid from Kindersley, Saskatchewan, which I, I, I had the pleasure of covering a few town councils during my time in Lloydminster, so I know it quite well. How does a kid from Kindersley, uh, Saskatchewan, decide politics is where it's going to be? You talk about your father being involved in politics, but like me, my father did one thing and I was going to do the complete opposite no matter what it was. So how did you, how, what was your first introduction into politics? Was it your father or was it something happening on the provincial level? You know, my dad ran in the 1978 campaign. My dad, uh, it is a bit as you described, fathers and sons have this, this kind of relationship. My dad to this day will remind me that even though I was the Minister of Finance, he actually has a road named after him in Kindersley. Uh, you know, I remind him the road runs to the sewer plant, but that's neither you know, here, here nor there. It is just that kind of a, a, a sense of, of civic engagement. But, you know, as a kid going around all these communities uh, with my dad when he was campaigning in 78, I was fascinated by how people would come and want to talk to him about issues that were really important to him. And it kind of made me believe in, in, in the system. And that's almost out of fashion nowadays. But there was this kind of sense that really, you know, politics and the democracy and, and that civic engagement is actually how we make change happen. And so for me, it was uh, maybe kind of instilled at an early age. And then certainly as I... Um, you know, as I graduated from university and became more aware of what was going on in the community around me as an adult, uh, I saw the need for, uh, you know, for us to continue to, to engage, not leave it up, just up to other people to do it. And so, um, you know, especially at the, at the point where I decided to run in, in 95, which is a long time ago now, um, you know, the NDP had just gone through its first term. It had made a number of extremely tough decisions. Uh, I think there was a group of us, particularly some of the you know, younger folks who felt maybe we had gone too far in the one direction and needed to recalibrate, uh, you know, restore a bit more hope and optimism, uh, figure out how to you know, reinvest in some of the services, but then really push forward with some of the, you know, the, the, the new thinking. And it was, a, it was a different time. There was just so much optimism uh, about what could be if we could just get it right. So that kind of drew me in and and, uh, you know, I think it enabled a lot of us at the time. Jonathan Wilkinson was active in politics at that same time. Scott Banda was uh, active in politics at the same time. And there were a number of us uh, kind of out of that cohort of, of young Turks at the time that were really thinking generationally there needed to be change and what could we do to make it happen. 
we'll talk about that change in a few minutes, but I still want to stick to the, the roots of Kindersley because was the NDP, uh, was your, first off, did your father run for the NDP in the 78 election? And I just want to make sure. Yeah, he that. did. He lost to, uh, lost to Bob Andrew by about, I forget what it was, a couple hundred votes at the time. So, and so it was, uh, you know, it was quite interesting. Uh, I mean, it was never lost on me when I was sitting in the treasury board room and the photos of all of the uh, former finance ministers sitting there. And there's Bob Andrew, you know, who, of course, I remember from, uh, you know, uh, Kindersley days, uh, but, you know, recognizing that, you know, the paths in Saskatchewan never diverged that far. Uh, you know, the communities are still fairly, fairly tight and, and fairly close. But, yeah, it's not exactly NDP territory now, I would no. say. I mean, I think the Maverick Party finished their second or the Buffalo Party or whatever it is they've got running provincially out there. So the question I have to ask, the, the, the million dollar question what is, what drew your family and yourself to the NDP? Yeah, it's always been a sense of, uh, of social justice. I mean, it, it is a, uh, a, a pragmatic view of the NDP that we have. I mean, I, you know, I would certainly always fit within the more moderate wing of the NDP. I'm not by any means on the, uh, you know, on the, the, the further left side. Um, but it is that sense that this is a party that gets the compromise right. You know, it really understands how to help um, move forward, both in terms of wealth uh, creation, but also redistribution to make sure you know people aren't left behind. So for me, it was it was that. Um, I mean, the other piece, just you know, locally. I mean, I grew up in a family that was very politically diverse. Uh, my grandmother was active in Diefenbaker's campaigns up in Prince Albert. My grandfather was a liberal. Uh, but it really was that kind of just sense that at the point that I was able to start thinking about politics, you know, uh, my parents encouraged me to, to kind of look at which party was closest to my views and figure that out. Um, and, you know, I think for any of us who are involved in politics, you realize that, you know, parties are big tents and there's lots of space within them to kind of find, find your place. But it comes down to kind of those core values that, uh, that are part of it. And the Western NDP, uh, you know, it has a very distinct identity. And I think a real kind of distinct sense of, of what can and needs to be done uh, to move the, uh, move the region and the country forward. You, you, you go off to university, if I'm not mistaken, University of Saskatchewan or Regina? Yep, Saskatchewan, yep. University of Saskatchewan. After your university days, you, you begin working for the NDP government under Ro Romanov. Mm -hmm. um, Take me through the back room of the NDP government, because like you said, it was in its first term. It had just defeated Grant Devine as uh, the new uh, government in 91 before you were elected in 95. What was it to be in the halls of power from a backer's perspective? Because I was in the halls of power in Queen's Park as the staffer, but I, I, I never had the opportunity. I, I toured the Saskatchewan legislature. What was it like to be in the, the halls of power, working behind the scenes in the government of a new government like uh, Ro Romanoff's? You know, it was interesting. I had been um, student union president when I was in, uh, at the U of S. And there was just such a sense of relief when the Romanoff government was elected uh, across the province. I mean, the divine government, notwithstanding some of the, the decisions they made were just they were not a, a particularly adept government certainly had a bad uh, you know they ended up with a bad hand there was a lot of economic turmoil around the time but uh, but they were you know largely seen to be a corrupt burnt out shell of a government and uh, you know the relief that that came from being there was unfortunately very short-lived uh, because it wasn't very long after the government uh, the NDP government came in that they realized the cupboards were, were much worse than bare. And um, it was really a shock to the system, that sense that of hope and optimism and all that could be just changed, all of a sudden was gone. When you're taking, you're spending a dollar 25 for every dollar you're bringing in, uh, and you know the lenders just aren't prepared to, to lend you any more money to keep going, it was a real uh, bracing moment. And, it caused, I think, a lot of people in that government and within you know, the party and the folks affiliated with it, uh, a bit of a rude awakening. And it really did cause us all to kind of go back and, and think again about what it was really were the core values that we needed to drive forward and make change. And that it wasn't just about spending. There were, in fact, a number of other factors and just uh, 
uh, uh, issues that needed to be, you know, fundamentally changed uh, from what the previous government was doing. So knowing knowing that the cupboards were bare, because uh, yep. I, I covered politics a lot, and uh, especially in my time in Saskatchewan, I remember reading history of politics, and you were right, the cupboards were bare, and they were spending more than they had, and I think there was a big... Big surprise, and I think there's a lot of governments who say that when they come into power, but in 95, 91, it was the case. Yeah. What were some of those priorities that the government at the time had to say, okay, we have to step back, we can't, we can't, we can't fulfill all the promises that we were just elected on because we now have to deal with the financial mess that we've been less left compared to what we wanted to do if we were told the truth going into this election. Yeah. A big part of it was uh, a decision that was made that we weren't going to abandon the agenda of change just for austerity. That, and I'll give you an example of that. Coming into the uh, uh, into office, there was a real view that the healthcare system should be updated to focus more on community care, on communities of practice, move away from the, you know, the sickness model to what was called the wellness model, a lot of kind of optimism about what could happen on that in terms of uh, better engaging uh, healthcare practitioners and nurses and uh, social workers and others into that continuum of care. And so much of that looked like it was derailed um, with the, the budget process. And, and there was a decision made by that first uh, you know, uh, cabinet, those first uh, couple of cabinets that were there, they weren't going to give up on that. They were going to continue to push forward with those reforms. The problem was, is that it still had to be uh, overlaid with the, the financial realities. And so the NDP uh, government was tagged uh, with the, the decision of how to right size those budgets and, and how to carve off money to make sure it could happen. And of course, famously made the decision to, to close the 52 rural hospitals, uh, including uh, the Plains Hospital, the, the large a tertiary care center that was in Regina South. Um, so those were, I mean, they were really bracing tough decisions. And as the government moved on through its first term into its second, there was a real uh, debate internally about whether we had gone too far on some of it. Um, and I certainly was of the view that, that the decision to close the Plains Hospital was not a great decision that was probably in hindsight not entirely necessary uh, and that we really needed to do something you know re-examine what was was happening I, mean, I had certainly traveled enough in my first term you know uh, and in fact when I was a staffer to a lot of these uh, smaller uh, communities where you know they were nicely kitted out uh, facilities but there were there were just not the patients I mean I remember going to one healthcare facility that they showed me the uh, uh, the maternity room that they had had funded and set up. I said, "Well, this is great," but they hadn't actually had a birth uh, in that room in I think four years by the time I had visited. And so there was just such a uh, you know at the same time we had this massive set of demands growing in in the centers for more specialized acute care. We had this sense of of decline happening. Uh, in these communities, and they were seeing their population shrink, they were seeing them lose services, they were seeing these services that couldn't justify unused stats, but were important to their identity, these were vanishing. And so this was a really tough um, a situation for the government to deal with. But as I, as I look back on it, you know, and you don't see change in the same way when it's happening as you get to when you look back, but, but the the impact of rural depopulation uh, in the province, the urbanization that was going on in the province at the time, was really a difficult um, external factor for that, for that particular government to manage. The pressure on more need for urban services, at the same time you're dealing with uh, you know, declining populations and uh, that sense of just political loss uh, in the smaller towns was really a, a bit of a time bomb for, for the Indian you, you You make the decision, I'm assuming, not like moments before the 1995 general election, but you, you have it in the back of your head that you're going to put your name on the ballot, I'm assuming, in a future election. Why, why do it in 1995? Was there someone pushing you? Was there someone saying maybe you should uh, look at that? Because 
if I'm not mistaken, yet again, Wikipedia should not be trusted for anything, but <laughs> it's the only spot I can find election results. There was an incumbent NDP MLA for the area of Regina South. What made you choose Regina South and what made you decide the 1995 election was going to be the election that you were going to run in? Yeah, so a couple of things. So, so the NDP, Regina South wasn't exactly a bastion of uh, socialism, let me put it that way. It had been won once before in 1991 by Serge Kiawa, who of course was uh, famous for uh, uh, you know, his time as a, a prosecutor uh, in the provincial government, prosecuting Thatcher, and of course tied up with the uh, David Milgard uh, uh, trial uh, before that. Serge was a uh, you know, larger than life personality, but he had decided not to run again for, for health reasons. And so we have this seat that is coming open. And um, actually the liberals at that point were the, the primary uh, contenders in that seat. They were really seen to be favored. There was a, um, a very high profile liberal candidate uh, nominated who was expected to actually challenge Haverstock or Linda Haverstock for the leadership later. So I had gotten a phone call from um, uh, a cabinet minister saying, you know, look, there's a seat down here. It's not a great seat. Uh, it's hard to say that we would hold it, but, you know, we really do need to, I mean, we're competitive in Regina and we need to, uh, you know, put forward a, you know, a, a, a sensible kind of a campaign and candidate down there and would you do it? And uh, there was already a candidate in the, in the running who was essentially running on kind of an opposition a platform internally, I mean, much more kind of left, uh, uh, you know, hard left within there. She wasn't a big fan of the, of the Roman government, thought there needed to be a lot of internal change. And so we got set up into this nomination. Fight. And- uh, Just I, between the two of you? Just the two of us. Okay. And so uh, I ended up uh, winning this, barely. <laughs> I mean, barely. It was, it was uh, maybe a dozen of uh, 20 votes uh, kind of separating us. And all of a sudden, it was uh, it kind of sprung on me like, oh, now I'm, I'm a politician. <laughs> I don't, don't know how that happened, but it was great. I I, I love the you know that experience, and you know immediately, of course, I ended up on leave from my job and uh, in the government because you can't can't do that. And um, I just thought, fine, I'll go knock on doors. I didn't know what else to do. So and so. How long was it from the nomination meeting to the uh, election? Do you remember the time frame? Like, was it six months? Was it two months? Was it five, like a no, year? It was yeah, it was a couple couple of months. It wasn't very long. Because and it was so a majority was, government at the time. So you had uh, an election date, or I'm assuming the government had an election date already set out that they were thinking about going to the polls because at that time there was no fixed election date in Saskatchewan. So yep. let's just jump back to the nomination meeting because there's one question I've always wanted to ask a politician and why not do it with you here? Nomination meetings can go any way because they are your party faithful. They are the people that you, you, you should be able to count on on election day to come out and vote. You, you are relatively a new kid to the Regina South area. This other gentleman's mm -hmm. probably been running for a bit. Did you go in thinking you were going to win or did you go in thinking, okay, this could go anyway and I'm not prepared for whatever happens? Like, did you have the two speeches prepared, the concession oh, yeah. speech and the winning speech? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it was largely a, uh, I mean, the speech was really, uh, we need to stay the course and alter a little bit as opposed to you know, the, my, uh, my opponent, you know, her view was much more, we need to crumple up everything and start over. And so it was, um, it, it was quite a fight anyway on a whole number of local issues, a whole number of kind of provincial issues, on all, uh, generational issues. There was just so many, many pieces at, at play there. And it was, um, uh, I don't know who was more surprised that I ended up uh, winning me or, or her, but, <laughs> but anyway, it ended up, uh, it ended up being what it was. Um, we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. 
so jump you know, forward to the actual election period now. right because this is this is where games get really played elections are like my super bowl i love them i i i, I, I like i follow them religiously like religion it, it is my super bowl being on the ballot, I had the pleasure of being on the ballot in 2015 up in Peace River, Westlock, which if you are an Albertan, you know, a liberal or anyone besides a conservative running in Northern Alberta. Ah, good luck. <laughs> I, seeing my name on the ballot for the first time, seeing my name on the sign, seeing my name on the literature was mind blowing to me because I, I, I am now trying to get people to vote for me. How was it for you to see your name on the ballot, the signs, the brochures, going door knocking and promoting yourself compared to another candidate? Because I'm assuming you helped candidates in the past like your father. Yeah, it was different moving from an organizer role to being the, the candidate. Um, the, uh, I remember saying to my campaign manager the day I voted, he said, how to fill the mark your, your name? And I said, you know what? I hate to say this. I just went down the ballot and found NDP and put my X next to it. You know, thankfully, it was my name next to it. But I mean, that was, it was just the way it was. I always just voted that way. So that's what I was doing. Who's the NDP candidate? Voting NDP. And, uh, you know, what was fortunate is a whole bunch of other people did too. And it was a, uh, but it was a very different kind of experience. Uh, one of the things that I found most different of running as opposed to campaigning for someone else is the, the dialogue on the doorstep is very different. You will have found that as a candidate yourself. What people talk to you about is much different when you are potentially going to be their representative than you're, you know, there on behalf of the party. And so that was, um, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting just the, the type of conversation, the change in that, what people would share, what they would say, how they would approach things. It was very different, but it was really, again, very reaffirming just to see that there was still that that relationship. And you know, I, I'll say I found that again when I ran federally in 2015 um, to a much different result, uh, of course, uh, losing that, uh, that election. But, uh, you know, again, the, the dialogue that happens, and I, I just don't think we can underestimate how important that what's now just referred to as voter contact actually is in terms of the process. Um, and that to me is still the strength of the Canadian democracy. And it doesn't matter who the, who the candidate is uh, or, you know, which party it is. There is that real desire just to have that, that dialogue. So that was, a, for me, a big difference, um, you know, switching from operative to, to candidate. Uh, I've covered elections a long time. I, my, I've had family members run elections in Ontario and out here uh, in uh, the Western Canada. But... Elections are not the same way that they were conducted back in 95, 99, nope. 2003, when you were elected. Election night dragged on. It was not an easy night for a lot of people. Do you remember that first election night in 1995, waiting for the results? Because you, you said you were up against a liberal sort of a star candidate. Uh, it wasn't a very progressive NDP friendly uh, area, but do you remember that night and what was going through your head and waiting for that official result for someone to declare, whether it be CBC or CTV, declare Andrew Thompson has been elected the new MLA for Regina South? Yeah, I do. Uh, I was gathered with my uh, uh, family, uh, with my, my folks and my sister and some friends, and we were at the house and just watching the, the results come in rather than go to the committee rooms. And the campaign manager said, look, once we've got a decision, we'll tell you to to come in and you can you know, um, uh, thank the, uh, the volunteers. So I get a phone call and he says, you know, I, I'm amazed at this, but, but you're winning. <laughs> so you're, you're up by about 400 votes. And he says, you know, I think you should come over and uh, thank, the, thank the volunteers now. So I said, okay, great. Which was kind of odd because the TV wasn't showing that. And so I get to the, you know, campaigns get their information quicker. Uh, because they've you know, got the phone-ins from the, from the polling station. So I go over, I no sooner walk in the door, and the campaign manager grabs me by the shirt, pulls me into his office. And he says, I don't know how to tell you this. You're actually losing by 78 votes. I said, I don't understand. <laughs> 15 minutes ago, when I got in the car, I was winning by 400. He goes, yeah, we, we had an adding error. And I'm like, oh, goodness. <laughs> but it was... It was this nail biter of a night until the very final poll comes in. 
which then again, the advance pole comes in and I pop back up. But it was, uh, it was a roller coaster. It was, uh, it was just one of those things where it's like, oh, okay. yeah, you're winning, you're losing, you're winning. Yeah. So you are elected in 1995 as the new MLA for Regina South. You have been in the halls of power behind the, the, the scenes, but you are now the politician. You are a politician, Thompson. Yep. And I, I, I have, I've asked this to every, every candidate, every politician who has ever come on the show. Walking into the legislature for the very first time as a newly elected uh, MLA, MP, walking onto that floor, what was that feeling like? Overwhelming, absolutely. Even to this this day, I, I remember it vividly. That first moment when you you walk in and you take your seat, and I was seated in the last seat in the last row of the government, and it was. Uh, uh, I mean, those who say that there is no bad seat uh, in the legislature or parliament in this country is absolutely right. I mean, it was just uh, uh, awesome to believe, you know, that I was in the same room where these. The heroes of you know my childhood had, had been people that I looked up to who, when I was a staffer in government or you know sitting as colleagues. Uh, it was just so impressive. And even uh, though, uh, of course, you know the way we sit in Parliament, my view was the back of the heads of all the cabinet ministers. And the only faces I saw were grumpy uh, opposition members. But it was um, it's still really kind of. Um, is important to have that experience for, for everyone to come together in that, that kind of a room. And I know we're having this big debate now about hybrid parliaments and the rest of it, but there is something to be said for, for bringing together the people from all the communities across your country uh, or I, region to, to be together and to, to actually have to sit cheek to jowl and you know, run into each other in the hallways uh, and you know justify the rhetoric that you're using in your speeches or in your you know, your campaign literature. You, 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 had, you had the ability to sort of have the uh, experience of working behind the scenes like we've talked about. Yep. But what was the moment in that first term that the weight of your work was put on your shoulders? Because what you do, how you vote affects people's livelihoods, affects people's jobs, affects people's... Uh, ability to get to work affects their pocketbooks. What was that moment for you in that first term when you went, oh, wow, this, this is a lot bigger than I thought originally before I got into politics, that I'm making the decisions that could help or potentially hinder the people of Saskatchewan? Yeah, you know, the, the toughest decisions, the ones where you actually are standing and voting and you realize the impact that you're having are, are not always the big ones. It's not necessarily the, the budget votes or those because there's so many things in that. It's not the throne speech voted. It's for me that the two issues that really were, um, I guess the three that kind of really sat with me. One was of course the debate about, about the Plains Health Center and whether it should be shut or not. And that was really difficult because it was a massive set of protests. It's my writing. Uh, the government was holding firm on its position and uh, really uh, put me in, uh, you know, I was put in a difficult position of having to decide whether to support the government or, you know, not. And uh, if anybody thinks party discipline isn't alive and well, let me tell you it is. Um, and there is just, uh, it's very unforgiving. Um, you know, that to me was... Uh, you know, always kind of sat there as being important. The second big debate that uh, was a little bit more, uh, less uh, uh, personally divisive, but was a question about what we do on things like, uh, you know, supporting uh, at the time that the, we had the tainted blood supply. And so, you know, the people who were getting hepatitis and HIV and should they be compensated and what should be the level of compensation, just realizing that those are the issues that are getting debated. Uh, on the floor of the legislation. And the, the other one that's never really sat well with me, and I always uh, had difficulty with, was the need to cast the vote to put uh, an end to strikes. And so when we would have to send uh, uh, pass back to work legislation, uh, it was always very, very difficult. I mean, first of all, your eyes surrounded by, uh, uh, you know, the workers who were impacted. 
and just realizing that sometimes the you know the hopes and aspirations of your you know, your political ideology don't always match up with the realities of what you need to do to quite literally uh, you know keep the power on. You bring up a good uh, topic, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but you you broached the subject, so let's let's go down this rabbit hole for a little bit, and that is party discipline. Um, yep. There's a lot of people who get into politics that they think I'm going to go into party politics and I'm going to be able to vote my conscience on every single bill and I'm going to be able to make my decisions for the best of my uh, constituents, no matter who uh, is my leader or whatever party I belong to, I'm going to be there to represent the constituents. That's not the case and it's not the case for provincially or federally. Does that do a disservice to our democracy when we have such a strict whipped uh, party system? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I think we would all like to believe that the individuals we send to the legislatures or parliament will vote as we want them. And, uh, you know, the simple fact is that, you know, they are members of parties and there is a caucus process. And so much of what happens in those deliberations in the caucus process are, are secret. Uh, and, you know, never come to light, but there's, I always felt that there was a very fair airing uh, of views within the caucus room. And, you know, through that, you reconcile what your views are, what your constituents' views are with what kind of the, the overall uh, wisdom of the, of the group is. Um, it does chafe when you have to, you know, swallow hard and, and vote not the way you want. Uh, and I, you know, certainly, you know, uh, say kudos to those, especially nowadays, who are, I think, taking a somewhat more independent view, um, you know, and, and speaking out and, you know, uh, voting, not their conscience, but voting their, um, you know, uh, in line with what they believe the constituents want. The flip side of that, though, is that we are protected, I think, as voters by the party system, so that we are not ending up with uh, MPs and MLAs voting their conscience on issues. Uh, I mean, you are elected to carry a particular message. And I think we need to you know, remember that that does provide a, you know, a, a mandate uh, for them. I would know, uh, I've got a situation here now. I live in, in uh, Spadina, Fort York. My MP uh, was elected as a liberal, but of course, you know, as, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, accusations of sexual assault and booted out of the party and he just votes however he wants now. I mean, there's no party discipline. And as a result, there's not really a good sense of representation. So, you know, we've got the two sides of that. I think the, the, the piece that needs to be emphasized is just how important that caucus relationship is and making sure that, that the MPs as caucuses don't lose that power. Did you, did you find that under Ro Romanoff that you had that party discipline, that party unity, that people were able to air the grievances within the party? You talked a little bit, a little bit but I want to specifically stick with Ro Romanoff, and then we'll go to Lauren Calvert, Premier Calvert afterwards. But Ro Romanoff, did you find that you were able to air the grievances in the, and you don't need to talk about what issue or what grievance, but were you able to air them in a caucus setting and no one take offense because it is that time when you were supposed to have those frank discussions at that caucus meeting? Well, you know, <laughs> the divisions within parties are often much, much harsher than the divisions between parties. And the grudges that get carried over all the conversation, I mean, there are no conversations in politics that don't carry repercussions. And, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, you know, I know should put a spoiler alert on that one, but it's, <laughs> that's just the way of it. So there are, people have hard feelings, people, you know, have uh, views and we, you know, we're all humans and we, we kind of look at it that way. One of the things that changed with, um, with the Romano government is in 99, they, the, the government lost its majority. And uh, this allowed us to, to embark on uh, committee reform, which was one of the things that I was really keen on. I felt that if, if MLAs could participate more effectively in committees, if we could spend more time in smaller groups, if we could spend less time out of the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the chamber itself and bring in more delegations, bring in more uh, individuals to kind of build that relationship back that we would strengthen the democracy and work against some of that kind of partisanship. Uh, I was young and pretty, pretty list, uh, idealistic at the, uh, at the time. And I don't know that that's in fact, uh, you know, really true. I mean, 
the committees, I think, still are one of the better ways to engage people. Um, but, uh, you know, the party whip is never far away. Did you find that working in a majority government compared to a minority government, you were able to work with the opposition MPs in a more civil manner in a minority government because you were there to all work together? Because we see right now federally, we have a minority government and it seems like each party wants to bash the other party. Um, in 99, when you did have that minority government, or when uh, the premier at the time had the minority government, did mm -hmm. the parties get along or is it as divisive as it is right now? It's just in 99, we didn't have 24 hour social media where everyone was able to jump on the one comment and drag it along for about 15 hours. Yeah, social media has certainly made the, the divisions more raw. I think that they are, are much worse. I mean, one of the issues with the 99 government is, of course, and almost immediately afterwards, there was a decision to form a coalition. And so I mean, this was back when Saskatchewan actually had liberals, but uh, there was a decision to bring them in. And the compromise was that two of them would enter the cabinet of the three and the other would become the speaker. Uh, and so thus restoring a, a sense of a majority, even though it was functioning as a, as a coalition. Um, it was difficult to work in, in that environment because, you know, there was a, a, a sense of wanting to move everything forward, but I mean, the parties still are parties, right? And, uh, you know, they are not uh, always aligned on issues and there was a bit more of a kind of sense of us and them within the operation. Although as it turned out, ultimately uh, the Liberals all ended up joining the NDP and uh, running as New Democrats in the next election. So it was such a weird, weird time that I think back on it. <laughs> yeah, Saskatchewan politics has always fascinated me. The Liberal Party, as much as it's still around today, there is that leader and they do have members. Uh, they, they aren't as mighty as they once were back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, I, I, we got, we, I can't let you go without asking them the, 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 about your time in cabinet. Because mm -hmm. you, like I said at the beginning of this episode, you held many cabinet positions. People get into politics for many different reasons. Would you have been happy to start start the conversation? Would you have been happy even if you wouldn't have made it into cabinet? Would you have been content with just being a backbencher, being able to go about your day? Or were you always striving to be a cabinet minister? I would, should, if I could get away with it, lie and tell you that uh, the most magnanimous way, I love being a backbencher. I was probably the grumpiest backbencher you've ever met. And it, it really goes to the fact that in my heart of hearts, I am a big time policy wonk. Uh, and so I love the idea of being able to make a difference. And the fact is in politics, the way you do that is by accumulating power and being able to, to drive it forward. So uh, I was, a, a, I would say a much better politician, a much happier politician when I was in the county. So uh, what was, and, what was and frankly, I was happier as a staffer than I was as a <laughs> No. What, what was the phone call? Do you remember the phone call, getting the phone call or getting the call to come into someone's office to talk about potentially putting you into cabinet? I do. And in fact, you know, it had been speculated that this was going to happen, not my appointment, but the cabinet shuffle was going to happen. Uh, and it got uh, derailed because of September 11th. And so then all of a sudden there was this, uh, you know, cataclysmic event that, um, uh, just set all politics aside for a bit. And then all of a sudden it was kind of uh, early October uh, of 2001. And um, I got a phone call from the Premier's Chief of Staff saying that you know, the Premier would like to see me, but first they need to go through the vetting process and come in and, and have this conversation. And um, yeah, it was quite something. I still remember the day signing the role as a, as a minister and just how remarkable it was. And the conversation with, with Lauren Calvert about about the role. So before we jump a little bit into that, I, I, I missed the big the big jump here, and that is leadership election in two thousand one. Uh, yep. uh, Premier Romanov decides to step down. Lauren Calvert beats about six other uh, candidates for the leadership. I cannot mm -hmm. find, for the love of me, who you supported in that election. Who did you support in that 2001 leadership election, Mr. Thompson? I was very clear that I wasn't supporting any of them, but would love to work with all of them. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, that's good to have that on record now. It so, was, uh, yeah, so that was a very kind of Mackenzie King kind of uh, approach to things, but it was uh, at the time, there was a big kind of generational divide. Scott Panda was running in that uh, that leadership from kind of a generational perspective. I had a lot of young guys around him. Uh, Chris Axworthy was running. He had um, you know kind of representing the the centrist moderate group, moderate, moderate group, which was kind of where I was more aligned. And then of course, Lauren Calvert was running, and you know Calvert really I think captured the best of what um, what people wanted in terms of kind of restoring some heart and soul uh, to the party. So. You know, when Lauren was elected, it was um, it was a real honor to get to, to you know serve not in his initial cabinet but the one just after. So you get sworn in, you sign the role as the new, yeah. and I want to get this right here, Minister of Energy and Mines. Now, yes. um, in Alberta, that that is kind of a death sentence for any NDP or progressive politician, and Saskatchewan uh, probably not a little bit the same. But you, Saskatchewan, you were two terms into your uh, uh, tenure as an MLA. Getting that call up and becoming the new Minister of Energy and Mines, was this a portfolio that even crossed your mind to be in cabinet? Or like you said, being cabinet was what it was better than being a backbencher. I loved energy and mines. I mean, okay. it was a portfolio I was really sorry to give up. Um, because it was just so much activity and, and opportunity. Now I should just say like, I was Minister of Energy and Mines when oil was $18 a barrel. So this wasn't, I mean, we were closing in wells all over the place. The oil patch was dried up in tumbleweeds. Um, but lots of interesting stuff going on in the mining sector. And it, you know, it was an economic portfolio and it was a chance to deal with a lot of land use policy and all sorts of good geeky things that I really liked. So it was, a, it was great. But then the portfolio got abolished I think about six months after I got it. So it was a. Oh, a, a, and, and you, talk. so you go from energy to mines to corrections and public safety. Then you, yes. So, I, because that's where you spend about a year and a half dealing with that yeah. portfolio. And I just want to make sure that. You, and at the same time, you're Minister of Saskatchewan Property Management Corporation as well. Yeah. Then you move to Saskatchewan Power Corporation, Minister of Learning, and then the big one. This is when you, you, you table a budget, you, you decide the policy, you decide sort of what goes into the budget, and that is Minister of Finance, but also Minister of Sask Energy and Minister of Saskatchewan Development Fund. Yep. Being Minister of Finance is a hard job because you are, you are the no man. The premier is the yes man or the yes woman, and they're the ones who say, go talk to the minister of finance and they'll try and put it in. And then you have to break everyone's spirit and say, we can't do it this time. Was it hard? Was it challenging, particularly in a government when you started to see a sort of an economic recovery? People were, Saskatchewan was kind of on an incline of revenue going in, mm -hmm. oil prices going up. Was it easy or was it hard? You know, it was... Uh, rather than saying easy or hard, I'd say it was, it was a good time to be there. Okay. And uh, there were a lot of things that I loved. It. It's definitely a tougher portfolio if you have got the relationships with your colleagues because so much of it, you know, the day starts out with a call from the Premier's Chief of Staff, usually telling you the Premier had been out at some event. And by the way, we just need to send a million dollars off to something or other uh, that was committed, uh, you know, over <laughs> in the evening, whatever it was. And, you know, then you go into, uh, uh, the usual kind of meetings with your, your colleagues and you're getting briefed and, you know, they've got no end of shortage of things that they need to spend money on. And then you go into caucus and you get beat up by them uh, over kind of the general direction of stuff uh, as you're kind of expected to defend it. And then you get a break and you get to go into the house and the opposition tells you how terrible you are for an hour and a half. And in the afternoon, you go back to meet with your deputies and your policy folks. And in the evening, you're off to events and rinse and repeat and it starts over. Again. But it was... Uh, you know, it was still a remarkable time period. And one of the best things I will say about serving them is that Lauren Calvert and I were, were very much on the same wavelength about what we wanted to do with the, you know, the growth in, in oil revenues. Because it, well, I was Minister of Energy when oil was at 18, I was Minister of Finance when it was at 80. 
and trending back up towards you know hundred dollars a barrel. So I mean, there was a lot of opportunity to to make reinvestment, to pay down debt, uh, and to cut taxes. And that was a very big uh, you know agreement that that we had early in uh, the premier and I as to kind of how we wanted to to do that, and that we would really kind of split the the new revenue, the uh, the ongoing revenue between tax cuts and um, service enhancements. And that any windfall revenue that came in, we would dedicate primarily to debt reduction. So this was a, you know, it was easy to explain. It allowed us to do a lot of great things. We were able to cut the sales tax from 7% to 5%. We were able to do a lot of business tax reduction. We were able to make, you know, historic new investments into uh, social services, into childcare, uh, into housing. I mean, it was, a, it was a good time to be in government. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So, yeah, but it really does kind of rely on having that, that understanding, that ability to, to convince people to come along with you on those big ticket items because it's not hard in finance to spend on a whole bunch of small things and realize you don't have the money left for the big ticket stuff so by protecting that early in child care protecting early in the reliance of the tax cuts we were able to get it done you are now as when you're a minister of finance you are in your 11th year of a 12-year term that in 2007, you make an announcement that you are not going to stand for re-election. Um, was that a tough decision? Because you were in the height of power, you were the minister of finance, like the natural order would be minister of finance, and then once uh, Lauren Calvert would leave, you would potentially be the heir apparent. Was it hard for you to finally make that decision? Or was there an other issue that was pressing on you that you said, okay, 12 years is enough, it's time to go? Yeah, well, the government was in its 16th year of office. Uh, it hadn't expected to get the, the fourth term. So did you read the, the tea term. leaves? I mean, the tea leaves weren't, I mean, we were really being kind of smacked in the face with the tea leaves. It wasn't, uh, I mean, it was going to be a fight. It wasn't an, an insurmountable fight. And there was a lot of conversation internally about, you know, what could be done, you know, to put us in a winning position. Um, and there were, you know, lots of different uh, different discussions about what that that would look like. Uh, ultimately, the the decision was that uh, you know the premier would stay, that he would continue to push forward the agenda that he had, had outlined. He would ask people to support it, uh, and that all made sense. It just um, wasn't, unfortunately, enough to be a winning proposition. the The pieces that were also sitting alongside me is um, there had been a, a decision. I'm not sure by who my own speculation, to leak the, uh, the last budget that I introduced. And it had hit the papers the weekend before the budget was due. And to me, it was a symbol of a caucus that had, had fractured, that there was clearly not trust uh, there that we could move forward together. Uh, it was very clearly a leak uh, internal to us. It wasn't a service leak. It was a uh, you know, a leak designed to put the budget in a good light, but very different than what we'd initially framed it as. And so I was very, uh, um, I won't say I was hurt by that decision, but it was a, you know, a real kind of realization that this wasn't going to be easy. And so many of the pieces that we've been able to rally around as a caucus and as a party uh, in the previous election, where we were campaigning on keeping the crowns public, you know, driving forward that uh, that kind of social and economic growth that we, we knew was just over the horizon had all of a sudden fractured. And, um, you know, I looked at it and I thought, do I want to stay in that situation, uh, you know, in this type of a caucus uh, environment? If we lose the election, do I want to serve in opposition? Uh, I was turning 40. There's only so many times you can actually make big changes in your career. And what else did I want to do? Uh, either in government or out. And so I just made the decision that it was it was time to go. It was as uh, good a time to go as any. So. Yeah. 
you you leave politics, they do get reelected. Um, they stay in government uh, with a reduced majority. I think it was like two seats, if I'm not mistaken, in that 2011. I think it was like 49 to 47 seats, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, don't oh, and, oh, in 07, uh, they were defeated. And the SAS party under Brad Wall comes in. Okay, it might have been the 2003 election that I'm thinking of. Yeah, 2003, I we... I apologize we, for uh, that immensely right now. I got yeah, no, 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 yeah, mixed in, up. <laughs> no, no, in 2003, we did get that historic kind of win. And it was a great, it was just such a great uh, uh, opportunity. And we'd had a fantastic campaign. And, uh, you know, it gave us a chance to kind of have a new, uh, new lease on things. And it really, I think, validated what uh, Lauren Calvert's agenda had. That transition from Roy to, to Lauren had really paid off. And it was great to give Lauren uh, his own, you know, uh, a majority government. So but then by 07, unfortunately, yes, we had uh, lost and Brad Wall uh, came in. So you, 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 go, you, you go off into retirement from elected politics, but the elected politics and politicians never officially die. <laughs> because 2015, you are in Toronto. Uh, Thomas Mulcair, I'm assuming, taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, would you like to run for the federal NDP in Eglinton Lawrence? And you say, sure, why not? So well, technically, I should say first off, I said no. So, okay, but at the end of the day, you you uh, agreed to put your name forward. Was yeah. was getting back into the game hard? Because time had passed, yeah. people might not know who you are in different province, or were you comfortable getting back into the political realm again? It was good to to get back uh, into it. I mean, Mulcair had uh, uh, Tom Mulcair had put forward a really persuasive. Uh, argument as to what they were wanting to do and why they, you know, where he saw me fitting into that. Um, you know, I welcome the opportunity to to lend whatever I could in terms of helping, uh, you know, Mulcair win um, at the time. And what they really wanted was an ability to tell a story about a uh, an NDP government that was a success in managing the economy. And, uh, you know, in, in that way, I was happy to be the poster boy to do that. Eglinton Lawrence, not the friendliest of NDP seats. Uh, I mean, we were competitive for a while, and then of course the bottom fell out of the NDP uh, vote altogether. And uh, it, you know, uh, it was a, a, a tough night with losses all around. So, so but I enjoyed it. It was, uh, I mean, you know, federal politics is very different than provincial politics. And uh, federal politics, when you're in Toronto and you're on the, you know in the TV studios and you're on the doorsteps and uh, dealing with the, you know, the, what is a central Canada as a, uh, you know, political establishment, very, very different than, than what we used to deal with in Regina South. So I, I got to ask the sort of those last two wrap up questions here and then yep. I'll, then we'll wrap up here. Um, you have a, a long history with the NDP provincially in Saskatchewan, federally. Uh, I'm assuming you were, uh, you campaigned federally in uh, the time while you were at MLA. Uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of NDP members who are trying to figure out where the NDP goes as a, a federal party. And then we'll talk provincially because provincially they are, they seem to be in the wilderness still. They did not make gains as they wanted to in Saskatchewan, but federally they didn't make gains as they want. What does the NDP need to do, in your opinion, to start going back to where they once were in 2011 under Jack Layton and in 2003 and 99 under Lauren Calvert and Roy Roma? Yeah, well, certainly when I look at the, at the federal numbers, I mean, there's a million Layton voters that haven't moved on to support Singh. And that's not a small number. Of voters. And I think we need to really ask ourselves, why is that? I mean, there are some, some reasons, certainly in 2015, that the NDP wasn't able to capitalize. I think that campaign's been dissected <laughs> by just yeah. about everyone, every which way. But, uh, you know, the question today, I think, really is, again, with the federal NDP, if it is interested in being a government, or is it happy just being the conscience of, of Canadians in Parliament? I don't know what the answer to that is. It seems increasingly to me that it is you know, wanting to be a strong voice for um, a social democratic left-wing movement. But the, the cost of that uh, is the ability to you know, build a, a big tent, bring in a lot of 
uh, middle class voters who are sympathetic to that direction, but not motivated. And I, I, this is, a, I think, really what the, what the challenge is, is that if the NDP federally is interested in just being a voice for the marginalized, it's doing a very good job. And I say that sincerely, I think it is doing a very good job, especially through the pandemic. But that is not uh, going to ever create enough of a voter base to propel it forward. And that's, I think, why it had such a difficult time uh, in this last election. If all it's focusing in on is redistribution of wealth and has no agenda for the creation of wealth, if it can't speak to that you know, desire of folks who just get up in the morning and want to look after their kids and get them off and figure out somewhere down the road, you know, how they're going to replace the car or what they need to do in terms of, a, you know, finding a better career or, or just planning the winter vacation. If we can't figure out how to, to speak to that, then the NDP is going to stay as, as a voice on, on the margins. Is that um, It doesn't mean they can't have success, but it, it doesn't mean that they're going to be in a, in a position to, to grow or ever potentially go. Does that translate into provincial politics in Saskatchewan as well? Because Cam Broughton, Ryan Mealy have tried and they have not been able to grow that base. Uh, do they, does the Saskatchewan NDP need to look into themselves before they can potentially gain back government? Or is it just Saskatchewan has moved on from the NDP governments of yesteryear? Well, I think it is, uh, if anything, that the, the pragmatic centrist voters are still the, very much the same. Their aspirations, their desires, what motivates them hasn't changed much. It's just there's not been anything much on, on offer. The, the NDP in Saskatchewan, of course, the, the huge defeat they suffered was under Dwayne Lindenfeld. And it was simply that Brad Wall snookered them and got the better of them. And Wall's campaign and Wall's personality was, you know, was uh, was one that just resonated. I mean, Brad Wall's a you know, very good politician. He and I uh, went to university together. We've been <laughs> debating <laughs> all the way back to our poli sci two twenty days. So I mean, you know, he's a he's a smart guy. Uh, I don't know about the politics always, but uh, you know, he got the better, and that was a big hole for the NDP. Cam uh, Broughton, when he was there, I think did a good job of trying to restore that. Didn't make the gains. Uh, again, tough against a, a popular premier uh, to do that uh, in a second term. And, um, you know, I think the challenge now for, for Ryan Miley, uh, you know, when Miley comes out of a different side of the party than I certainly was with, is whether he can uh, make that, that leap to really representing uh, those kind of hopes and aspirations of uh, ordinary uh, ordinary voters. Uh, not to say that we ever need to abandon you know, being the voice of, of the marginalized, but you can't just be the voice of the marginalized. Because you can't, uh, I have always believed, you can only make real change happen by sitting on the government side of the house. And uh, if the NDP today believes something different, then it's a very different uh, uh, approach than you know, what propelled uh, Romano or or Calvert, or Motley, or Horgan, uh, you know, in, in terms of how, how that works. And so, you know, we'll see what, uh, what comes out of it. Um, I've certainly been a little bit disappointed in, in how uh, little reflection the federal NDP has spent coming out of this last election. Um, this belief that the Eat the Rich campaign that they had was going to be wildly popular, uh, I guess was, it was popular, it just didn't translate into votes. I agree wholeheartedly. There's a lot of soul searching that, that that party needs to do, and I don't know if they're ready for that conversation to start yet, but if they want to get back to that 2011 glory days of being in opposition to potentially be the government waiting, then they have a lot of soul searching to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. My last question to you is this. Looking back on your career, you know, Looking back on the time in politics, looking back on your days in uh, as a staffer, did you enjoy it? Oh, absolutely. Even when I hated it, I loved it. <laughs> you know, maybe it's when you look back, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, there was something big happening, and it was great to be part of that. And I don't... Uh, uh, I don't regret really very much. I mean, there's always things you would do differently. I think you had it to do all. 
but that sense that really we moved the needle and, and did some great things and some great things for, for people was really, uh, really significant. I, I encourage people to, to get involved. I mean, the only question I always, I get asked frequently is, is should you do it as a young person? And if I was doing it over, what would you do it as, well, say 27 when I was elected, what did I know? Um, you know, are you better doing it then or would I be, you know, are you better doing it at the age I'm at now? Um, I don't think there's a wrong answer to that. I think, it, it, I think if, you, if you've got something that you want to accomplish, get involved and, and figure out how, to, how best to make it happen. And it really doesn't matter what the age is. You, so. you've, you, opened the, you opened the question up that I have to ask now. Is, elect, is Andrew Thomas done with elected politics? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, perfect way to end this. <laughs> I'm quite happy to be a uh, curmudgeonly pundit and uh, hang on the podcast and share my views to whoever wants to, to talk about it. But hey, I always you... said when I was in, uh, you know, when I was in, in office, we used to get these letters and people would write you letters, and, you know, rudely, you know, rudely outline what they thought. And I said, you know what? When I retire, I'm going to become that guy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write my MPs. I'm going to write my MLA. And I'm going to tell them everything they're doing wrong and what they should be doing right. And they should uh, listen to I still to aspire you. to that. <laughs> I still aspire to that. Um, I want to thank you, Andrew, for doing this. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Um, for those who are listening and watching this, uh, uh, thank you for tuning in for another great episode. We'll be back tomorrow with another Saskatchewan native currently residing in Ontario as well, because it seems like we're doing the Saskatchewan month in January. But uh, please tune in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Hit the subscribe button and we will be back tomorrow morning. Have yourself an excellent Thursday afternoon or Thursday, rest of your Thursday, and we'll be back Friday morning. Talk to you later.